Hello everybody, my, my name is Mark Fraser, right? so I'm the ambassador here in uh, London, they're all very welcome. Uh, older crowd than we're used to tonight, um, that's good to see. Um, so we're delighted to be here to partner with Digital Irish uh, for this event, to, to celebrate all that goes into the work of founders and entrepreneurs and, and everyone who goes in to support them. And, uh, that great ecosystem of business and innovation and creativity and imagination that supports all of you and that, that our country has done so well in recent years and in recent decades now and something we do very well at home but I'm glad to say increasingly we do it very well abroad as well and Digital Irish is also to be part of that in New York and North and other places and so we're, we're delighted to be, be here tonight and for a panel discussion and a few short words in a moment and and uh, some networking, which will be uh, facilitated by the uh, catering staff at the embassy, who are all experts in type of literature and this. <laughs> so, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jack, who's going to introduce uh, this evening's event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, uh, for everyone who doesn't know me, my name is Jack Stenson, uh, I'm Chair of Digital Irish here in London. Uh, firstly, can I say thank you very much to the ambassador and the fantastic staff here at the embassy who have been a pleasure in helping organise today. Um, and also to our sponsors, uh, ongoing sponsors, Tate and Wesson, who are uh, helping uh, this evening. After five years of living in London, I moved to New York in 2018. I was blown away by how strong the Irish community was there. Uh, there was something about the go get em attitude with New York coupled with the Irish uh, you know, drive to just have a chat and have a bit of mischief that just led to some really serendipitous encounters. As someone professionally and personally curious about innovation, uh, the, the events I ended up going to were Digital Irish. Um, and Digital Irish is a warm, uh, non profit, informal community which shines a spotlight on Irish led innovation, whether it's through startups or corporates. And thousands of people, whether grads or C suite, come to our events over the years. Uh, and along the way, they've, made, they've, they've gotten uh, job offers, investments, and made countless friendships. I joined the board of Digital Irish in New York in 2018, and now today we're set in London for just over two years. Uh, we have a fantastic committee here of people, a well balanced committee of various uh, ages, industries, and uh, female majority. Since then, in London, we've done spotlight events with some leading Irish innovators, one of whom I just saw walk in the door a few minutes ago. Uh, on sports tech, e-commerce, health, sustainability, a spotlight on generative AI, uh, and as well as having some much needed drinks on a hot summer day or two after London Tech Week. And to all your friends and colleagues, uh, the next event we'll be hosting is on one of the biggest burning platform issues in the world today of climate tech, so we'll be having that in April. Uh, please tell any friends or colleagues of yours who go to digitalirish.com or follow us on LinkedIn to find out more about that. But on to the reason we're here today. Today, the reason we're here is a celebration of founders and startups. And start a startup is more than just a business. It's a crucial build building block for progress in society. As evidenced by so many different founders we have today and the stories you'll hear on the stage shortly um, in a minute. In my 10 years in London, I've seen so much progress in the Irish community. But having lived in New York, I know that there is so much potential for more. Having seen how we operate and thrive, uh, in, in New York, that there's potential if we were just to find our own way to pay it forward a little bit more. Whether that was finding an hour a month to, you know, have a chat with a grad from your university, from your alumni, whether it's uh, going to these events or London Irish Business Societies or others and meeting someone new, or if your business needs someone uh, a new innovative solution, reach out to Enterprise Ireland. There's the, the potential for, pro for progress here is amazing, uh, and all it takes is us to have a little chat and we're pretty good at it, it's not that hard. So, on progress, um, George Bernard Shaw had some words that resonated on this. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world, but an unreasonable man persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. So tonight is a celebration of the founders here, the ones yet to come, and the unreasonable men and women who have outrageous ambition and unyielding optimism. Thank you very, very much for joining us this evening. I'm just going to hand over to uh, Danny Han, who is our sponsor this evening for Taylor Wesson. Uh, just say a word. Thank you. Good 
Good evening, everybody. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues and myself, uh, Taylor Weston, we're obviously delighted to support Digital Irish this evening across their events for uh, 2024. Uh, Jack asked me to keep this to 60 seconds, but I obviously agreed, but I didn't tell him that lawyers have been in six minute increments. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll do my best. Um, Taylor Weston acts for some of the largest innovative tech companies in the world, uh, and many of those are household names. Of course, one of the key drivers that we find is that we need to search for the next leaders in the tech space. Events like this are exactly why uh, Taylor Wessing is proud to support uh, Digital Irish. An event like this showcases the very best of Irish tech, and we're proud to support that. So I think with that, I'd like to hand over to that. Enjoy the evening, make connections, and look forward to seeing you across many events in the next year. And with that, let's go out the show. Can we please invite our moderator, Alan, please. Thank you, Jack. And Deirdre O'Neill from Creativity, Charlie Butler from Balance Insights, and Ollie Kilkenny from Riley. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, if we're okay, Charlie, we might start with you and just give a brief introduction and then we work down this way. Um, my brother tells me not to use mics because I'm too loud, so I will go very far in my face. Um, my name is Charlie Butler. I am the co-founder of a company called Bounce Insights. And we help brands do research. Um, and I moved to London about six months ago to set up our office here. And I run on New York, so I will be chatting to you later. And you're up to 20 odd people now. Yeah, we have uh, just over 20 people in Dublin and four people now in London. Um, and yeah, supported by Enterprise Ireland from the very start when I was in university. So. Excellent. Um, my name is oh, I made that there. Um, my name is Anya Kilkenny. I'm one of the founders of Riley. We provide 100% organic cotton period products, period products that are better for our bodies and better for our planet. And we serve our customers in two ways. We have a subscription service direct to our customers' door through Shopify, and we also have corporate partnerships. So we partner with corporations like AIB, Accenture, KPMG, Deloitte to provide our products into their bathrooms for their staff and their customers as well. So we're live across Ireland, the UK and throughout Europe and I've just moved here to London um, to set up our office here where there's three of us so far and um, looking forward to meeting so many more people tonight as well. That was way better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> and and really, really, really good branding by the way. If anyone has seen the branding, it's definitely phenomenal. Um, my name is Deirdre O'Neill. I'm co-founder and chief commercial and legal officer of Fertility. Fertility is a revolutionary approach to women's reproductive health care. We provide affordable and accessible personalised medicine from menstruation through menopause across the reproductive lifespan. We do that by providing it to a direct-to-consumer basis as well as a B2B basis um, where we provide organisations with reproductive health screening, education and policy support and our goal is that organisations all seem to become reproductively responsible, which is the accreditation that we give to organisations that provide this, this necessary level of care. Excellent. You probably answered the first question for me, so I'm going to sound a little bit like a VC here, but uh, Charlie, I might start with you, and, and I guess, can you share what was the problem that you guys identified first that, you know, was driving you to set up the company? Yeah, of course, I think it was primarily due to, I felt like, Brands didn't really understand my generation at the time when I was 19 or so when we set it up and it felt like they couldn't get access to the right information to make the right decisions and at the time when I was in university it was all around like scraping data and that kind of freaked me out and so we tried to build a platform around getting kind of like bought in consumer sentiment and feedback so built a platform with consumers all around the world that they could give their opinion and their insight to Coca-Cola, to Diageo, to Tesco on how they're behaving and what they're doing. So the problem that when we spoke to brands was that the solution was speak to Jen or Jimmy in big research agency and it would take eight weeks and cost them 100,000. Um, felt like there was a lack of technology in the space and we felt like the approach had to be consumer led. So what would make me give my opinion to Coca-Cola? If you could crack that and swim upstream, that's how we went about doing it. So felt like they didn't understand what I wanted and that the way that they were doing it kind of freaked me out. So we tried to build a solution around it. 
some pretty big marquee brands already in London. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know why, but pretty much every marketing director in Ireland will meet a student if we just ask for advice. So, <laughs> uh, and me asking for, for advice was a complete ulterior motive. Um, but we ended up then, like Hilary from Diageo and Carl Devi, who was with Tesco, pretty much all of, us, all of them met me. And I think they just, they were like, wow, this person's actually listening to the problem I have, instead of just shoving solutions down people's throats. Um, I think that was the reason why they met me, and then when I was leaving university, I said, I think we might have solved your problem, will you try it? They would, because why not? And they wanted to see kind of a, someone at least trying to solve the problem in a, in a new way, so a bit of boldness, but we got there. And I think that's going to be one of the themes of tonight, actually, we've just been speaking to the ambassador about the importance of just reaching out and using access to the diaspora here in the UK, in the US, wherever, just reach out, people will... I think um, Patrick, I don't know Patrick is still here, um, you know, was mentioning, you know, one of the things about being Irish is we're not transactional like, like other countries, we're very much kind of happy and open to support others, so I think the fact that you went and talked to so many is, is kind of one of the unique things you can do in Ireland, you can get access to so many senior people that don't know you through connections and just uh, take advantage of it. Um, Next question, I'm going to throw this one to you, Deirdre. So, what have been some of the biggest challenges you've faced in the journey to date? Um, funding. Girls just want to have funding. The reality is, is I'm a venture capital lawyer, so my background, I'm a dual qualified lawyer in Ireland and England. And so I know the gem, I know, I know how to speak to VCs, I know the investment language, I know the docs. If you weren't in that world, I, I, my heart goes out to anyone who doesn't fully understand that world. And yet, it's a, it's a sink or be drowned environment. Um, and I think one of the positive things is getting through that. And I think one of the positive things is if you can manage to, if you can manage to survive in the environment that's just passed in the last few years, you can survive anything. Because I think the, um, the skies are full of black swans. And I used to fear them, but now I'm like, come here, my birdies. <laughs> Have you come across Mary McKenna uh, by any chance? No. So Mary and Sinead and Denise, who are on our actual Digital Irish Committee, um, have, is it Awake in Angels? Or Awake, Awake in Angels, yeah. Awake, oh, you're familiar with them? Yeah, I'm correct. Oh, great. So, so they're a classic example of Irish entrepreneurs that are now looking to sort of support female founders in Ireland. So, um, but I think they're more early stage, right? They have a full group, and um, they make a home for, for female founders, and then they have Awake in Angels, which is a syndicate to make. Um, God, I should be being paid for this or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that anyone can get involved in it. And it's really just to understand the process around um, being an angel investor. You could, it's as little as a thousand euro to be involved, but really to understand that process. And um, if you're going to raise money from actually being an investor as well. So it's really good. Um, what do I do recommend anyone to get involved in? I think they're currently just back from the US and in Belfast at the moment. So again, for anybody just from a you know, founder point of view, Definitely check those guys out. Um, Orny, I'm going to pass the same question to you in terms of the biggest challenges you've faced on the journey so far. I feel like I could just copy and paste what Deirdre just said in terms of funding. So um, we raised uh, funding twice. So at the end of 2021, we raised 500,000 and then we raised 1.5 million last year as well. And it was very much, we just didn't know what we were doing. And we're not expected to know, but it's so difficult because there's not just one journey that you can go on to raise money, there's so many different avenues depending on what you want to achieve from your company um, and like how long that journey is going to take as well. So I think our biggest challenge was really understanding everything behind it and making sure that we were surrounding ourselves with the right people to advise us. Um, but yeah, it takes so much longer than you would think and there's so many different things that can go wrong. So I think that was definitely our biggest challenge as well. But we got there in the end. Yeah, no, well done because it's definitely tricky. And uh, you know, did you raise in Ireland or the UK or elsewhere? Or was it a mixer? We actually did um, two rounds of crowdfunding, and which is quite unusual um, where it was at the time when we were doing it for a company to do two rounds. I know you do crowdfunding as well. Um, and the reason behind that was because we're very much a brand, and thank you for the compliment on our branding. Um, we're very much a brand, and we have a very um, clear mission as well. We uh, fundamentally believe that period products should be treated the exact same way as toilet paper, so they should be readily available in every single 
the bots that you walk into. So for us, crowdfunding really works for us because people can um, really understand what we're trying to achieve. And we wanted, we had a lot of people reach out who wanted to be involved in our um, in in our round, but we were so young as well that you know we were only six months old when we did our first round. So um, crowdfunding made sense because everyone could sit and. Um, not everyone was on the cap table, um, so that we could do it that way. So um, it was really good for us. And then the first person who invested when the public crowdfunding went live was a customer. So that very much drove us forward as well and helped us to know we were doing the right thing. Yeah, but again, it resonates as a, a big challenge because I guess there's a lot of messy cap tables out there as well. People that did secure funding in early stage find that they can't be, you know, can't secure further on them because they just cap table is in a mess. Yeah, exactly. So crowdfunding is a really nice way of um, helping that because everyone sits behind um, the, the crowdfund, so it's not as messy. Yeah, excellent. Charlie, same question, biggest challenge to date? Um, I don't have enough time uh, to go through all the challenges. I mean, funding is obviously one of those uh, classic ones that I, I can't connect, obviously I can't connect on the, on the access to funding, I won't even try to when it comes to kind of female founders seeking capital. From our point of view, uh, funding was obviously a challenge, but um, partly because of my co-founder being a computer science student and um, being incredibly black and white, we just added method to the madness, treated it like a sales process. Every single person who has money in Ireland has probably been on an Excel sheet and, um, and we tracked it down like a pipeline and we understood the incentives of VCs. You know, they work on the power law and they work on certain total addressable markets. And, you know, I met with the VCs in Ireland. We've raised money from kind of UK, Ireland, and they're raising out of the US. And once there's a connection of what they're trying to do, um, you know the metrics you need to hit. And the easiest way to close around is drive revenue whale. Well. So um, we just focused on what we needed to control because there's so many uncontrollables in, in doing a startup that you can absolutely paralyze yourself with fear and anxiety over them. And um, that you kind of just look at what you need to do every single day from the funding perspective. I would say the biggest challenge on our side was trying to like pick people as part of that journey. So investors are obviously one of them, but like hiring is another one. And um, I went from being a bartender to trying hire, hiring people. And um, like Daniel Kahneman, like we'll talk about it, like we're terrible at interviewing. We've no idea what, who's going to what. And like trying to hire for a salesperson, I'm such an optimist. I'm like, yeah, I would buy from that person. And you just like completely skip like all logic. Like at least with a software engineer, they can build something and you go, okay, you can build that thing and you're coachable, but so many of our hires were research people and commercial people that you really have no idea what you're doing. And even some of the best advice I continue to get, they don't give me advice because they don't have the context, they just ask me the right questions. So I think I've gotten way better in my early days, I was just like trying to be a sponge and take in all this information, but you kind of just have to fall in your face yourself. Um, and no one has failed more, I know I'm young, but like no one has failed more than me in every single decision on this. Um, but you just need to constantly pick yourself back up when those challenges come. And kind of find joy in it as well. You have to laugh at yourself when you just make terrible, terrible decisions. Um, <laughs> God, I'm not making myself look fair. <laughs> I am, we are still alive, and we're, uh, we're still hiring, so that's the yeah. uh, Generally speaking, it's just not as romantic as, as you might think. There's so many challenges. and. You probably get it wrong the first time. And that's why they back second time founders. <laughs> yeah, and I'm the CEO of a tech startup myself as well, so I can I can relate to fundraising, I can relate to the challenges. It's a very tough gig. Uh, very rewarding, but you're um, there's no playbook, right? It's literally what comes after your diary or what comes at you in hiring is a classic example. Or even once you go and raise and you've got to hire people and they're all looking for seven or eight K. But there's no, there's no outcome that you can try to see, there's no finish line, like the thing that we try and live off is like a happiness of pursuit, not a pursuit of happiness, because if you don't find joy in like the ups and downs and get hit in the face, you're going to take nine punches for everyone you land, so you kind of have to find kind of a weird joy in that like hard thing, that is the most fulfilling thing you can do, but like so many people talk about that they want to become entrepreneurs because they see only the business post article, or they only see the outcome of the external validation, but so much of it is finding joy in solving that next challenge with the person that you decided to do this thing that you really had no right to do. And if you find joy in that, then you realize that it's going to take 10 plus years. And if you have that commitment and your why is strong, then I mean, the challenge is like you have them in any job, it may as well be big. No, I totally agree with that. Um, okay, a related question actually, and it's um, warts and all, right? So, 
Uh, Jeff, I'm sorry, what advice have you got for those in the room tonight who may be considering going down the entrepreneurial path? Yeah. <laughs> we said we weren't going to say that. <laughs> um, I think you've nailed it in terms of that description, that you have to be able to take it on. I think one of the things I really struggle with is this expectation, this instant gratification expectation that everyone has, that you get, you swipe and you have something, you, you press a button and it's there. And I think that there's a reality behind it that it is really, really hard, um, it's unending. I think we particularly picked one of the toughest sectors in one of the toughest countries, because with healthcare, you only get one chance. You don't, you don't get to mess up, you, don't, you only get one chance in terms of people's trust. And especially when it is something that is such a, a clinically and personalised route where we're dealing with people's reproductive health care, fertility, infertility and gynaecological conditions. The prevalence of those is really, really high. One in three women has a gynaecological condition. One in, one in six couples are infertile, but in Ireland actually it's one in five couples. So the, the prevalence of this, and you're dealing with such a wide range of emotions that it's very hard to get the, the angle right. So you have to, firstly you have to get, gain people's trust. Actually, firstly, you have to do clinical trials. You have to go the entire clinical route in terms of making sure the science is as perfect as it could possibly be that people will trust you. So clinical trials took years. Then regulating, so we have to regulate it across the EU as well as the UK. So that sort of double layer of, of work, it, it just, I think that the advice is that don't underestimate what's involved in something, and particularly with us, that, that necessity to do clinical trials, ongoing clinical trials, having a full research team conducting these clinical trials, and then having to constantly maintain a level of regulation that means that your, your output is never questioned. Because you we're in a world where everyone questions everything, and you only need to look to a comment section to see that someone has absolutely rinsed someone or just taken away their credibility in a second, even though you could have spent years building that up. And I think that, um, I think that trying to block out the noise of that is one of the hardest things, but also it's just that, that constant need to, I guess, keep listening to people, not just have to focus on each sector. I think it's, um, it's ongoing. I think you're right when you say that it is, you never finish. Um, and I think that, that that's in particular with what we're doing. There's, a, there's kind of a contradictory term in terms of venture capital and what the expectation is. It's sort of, hey, you shouldn't be doing too much because you'll go through burnout. You can't hire people because then your runway will be shorter. And hey, you should, um, you should really try and conserve money and focus on one thing and really specialise in that one thing. Do you have to have lifetime value? So you should really diversify your revenue streams. So it's this constant narrative of like whiplash of, well, but we're supposed to diversify revenue streams, but then how are we going to do that with capital? And I think that's one of the exhausting things is listening to the constant behind things, but also the, the need to just have sheer grit and determination. Yeah, I think you've kind of mentioned that a, a really key point is this just barrage of stuff coming at you with different perspectives, different agendas, um, and often very contradictory, but also very motivated by the stance of the, the person giving it to you. So, you know, your ability to say F off or whatever um, on a regular basis is <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> very, very important. Um, same question to you, Anya, about people in the room thinking about entrepreneurship as a, as a career option. Thoughts, observations? <laughs> so I'm um, a hopeless optimist, so I would say do it, but like do it now. Um, I just think I've gotten so much um, career growth out of the last three years and so much personal satisfaction as well that I really do think um, it is such an exciting uh, thing to start your own business and be part of that journey when you have a really clear mission. Um, I think um, the three of us have something in common when we sit up here in that we all have a founding team and I think that's really important to have as well. The journey can be so lonely and I have two co-founders and we always say that one of us is having a meltdown at all times. So it's okay because the other two are going to be there and it'll be fine. Um, but I think a founding team and having trust within your family founding team and really, um, is that my and um, being able to work on that. We have a business coach that we work with between the three of us to really make sure that we're working to the best of our abilities um, and that we're you know, solving problems together. Um, so I think that would, that's really important. And the other thing I would say is 
to, if you are going to start a business, to get revenue generating as quickly as possible. So we started our business with an MVP, which obviously is a tech uh, term, but minimum viable product. And um, if I saw my product now, I would not buy it. I don't know how we have any customers at all, or our website. But it's really important to just get out there so that you know people get their your product into their hands and that you can start getting that feedback as well. We used to actually, within the first six months, ring our customers. We used to block out time in our diaries on a Friday. And first of all, no one wants phone calls anymore. No one picks up the phone. And second of all, imagine if the owner of Netflix rang you and was like, how is your subscription going? So it's they're so strange. And then second of all, it's obviously like a period product subscription. So no one wants to answer those questions. Uh, so I think it is really important to get out there. And and again, kind of playing to the Irish theme of tonight, I think being an Irish entrepreneur has certain distinct advantages, right? It goes back to some of the topics we talked about earlier in terms of the soft power of the Irish diaspora, the fact that you can talk to people, but actually also state agencies like Enterprise Ireland, which again, there's no equivalent anywhere I've come across in the world that has generous um, packages around funding, um, whether you use it or not, but they have um, plenty of sort of matching rounds products which gives access to cash pretty early on. There's grants, there's um, access to tech resource, access to professionals. So again, it's a kind of key point in the Irish kind of option as an entrepreneur, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like we we have, uh, when we set up out, so I was in final year university with COVID and uh, we were about to go out of business and we got a prime grant from the Bledsworth's office. Alan Collis was our DA and we've now moved uh, out of the HBSU program and Enterprise Ireland, but we literally would have died, I'd say, four times if it wasn't for Enterprise Ireland. And COVID hit, our entire like infrastructure in the platform shut down because we relied on coffee retailers to provide incentives. Uh, they gave us a private grant so that we could keep two of our co-founders who got offered over six figures at a university as computer scientists. They settled for 10k to stick with us, but because we got a grant. And then because of COVID, we were going for the HBSU program, which was the co-funding, and Helen said, listen, can you get 150? It's usually 250, but because of the COVID and because of how difficult the funding environment was, they said, if you get 150, we'll give you 100 later. Like, they are purely investing in people. We had no right to raise that money, um, and we are now past the HBSU program, rolling out in the US, and I wouldn't be at if it wasn't for them. So I think, again, you have to ask, and you have to realize it's a relationship-based thing. I checked up with EI every month for the last three years, whatever they needed, and they have given us back everything in return. So I think, again, you can be pessimistic and you can say, you know, we don't get enough support, there's not enough people supporting founders in Ireland, but I think when you go out there and it's reciprocal and you lean on people, the right people, like we, I just don't have the opinion because yes, you know, there's challenges with everything, but generally speaking, we've had such an incredible experience with them, and we continue to. And um, we've just got a grant to go after the US, and we again, we, they've pushed us to go again. And again, it's a huge, huge support in the ecosystem. And to your point, they're the largest uh, tech investor in Europe by deal volume, and that's a state out agency in Ireland. It's crazy. So pretty hopefully getting some cash back now with some recent um, exits. So <laughs> there's a lot of cash set up. Um, I wrote this question and I'm tempted to skip it. What is your biggest regret when you reflect back on your journey so far? It's a bit of a negative one. Anyone want to jump at that? If not, we can... Any big regrets there? Uh, I, think, brother, I, think, I, think brothers, Charlie? I think for me it's, again, you probably noticed that can be quite self-deprecating. Um, but it's going sooner and going global bigger. You know, I played the student card and the young card way. It was kind of a defense mechanism I used a lot. I like, oh well, you know, we're not that big because, you know, I'm just out of college or whatever it is. But like, people don't care about it. They care about the problems being solved. And, you know, once you have a pitch to a COO of a global brand and you don't get laughed out of the room, you're like, oh, this isn't it. And I think we probably stayed in Ireland too long. We kind of waited and we said, well, now it's everyone's global, and remote, we'll stay in Ireland. But the kind of increasing your scope for luck by moving to London or by moving to New York or by reaching out to people. Like so much of doing well in a startup is kind of persistence and luck combined. And I think for me, it's just like Irish people probably don't back themselves enough. And like, if, you know, if you speak well about yourself, you kind of get slagged. And it's 
fair enough, I love this part article too. But generally speaking, it probably is something that I, if I was to go back to my younger self, I'd say just go out and back yourself a bit more. Like, no one cares about your age. Uh, you probably don't look that young anymore anyway. Etc. <laughs> <laughs> Etc. Et so, and, and you know, you're, you're going to laugh because Paul Graham, and the leading kind of VC, will often say that that's the key point starting young because you don't have a mortgage, you have no commitments, you can get by on noodles. You know, you, <laughs> you can pay yourself 5k a year and squat, in that, and squat in the bedroom somewhere. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, when your age starts with a four, it's a little bit more difficult to get bigger commitments. So, anybody that and that advice, I think it's totally spot on. Yeah, but I also would say that it's, never, no, it's not too late either. Like, you know, I mean, and also not every company has to be a VC work Vivo style company. You know what I mean? Like, so many of my friends are now setting up things because they want the autonomy of it. They're not trying to raise capital. They just want their own business and want the fulfillment and having no founders and all that sort of things. It doesn't have to be just one way. Yeah, I think the best thing is get one check and not need to go back for further funding. Or no funding at all in my next business. <laughs> Actually, the reverse of that, right. which is actually no, I, I completely agree with you. But actually, because we incorporated in the UK, in England they hold the right to free healthcare like Americans hold the right to a gun, and people don't want to pay for healthcare. And that's why you know we launched a healthcare product that provides accessible care to people when there are wait lists. There's over seven hundred thousand women on wait lists to see gynecologists. In, in the UK, and we're providing a solution that provides diagnostic testing, gynecologists on the demand, demand, telemedicine, consultations, you name it, you can have it that day, next day, prescriptions the next day, and, and yet people's reticence to pay for anything because of the national health system means that you have that additional barrier to entry, even though the barrier to entry here for checking in your reproductive health is that you on the national health system, you have to have been actively trying to conceive for one or two years, depending on where you live, or that you have to be—you um, have to have had multiple miscarriages. And that, that's a barbaric barrier to entry. Uh, to just check in, like maybe you just have symptoms, or maybe you're just curious, and, and that's the majority of women are actually just curious. And I think the UK was such a tough market for us, but Ireland—we've been trying to do Ireland for 19 months. It's only just cleared that we're kind of, you know, fine for. Full, full business in Ireland, and the reason for that is because we're dealing with biological substances, so it's an at-home blood test. The only place that actually checks the blood, or checks the proper appropriate analytes, there's no lab in Ireland that will check, check the appropriate analytes and we test it. <coughs> there's no laboratory that will do it, and all of the samples have to be sent back to England, so 50% of samples were hemolyzed before they even, or cl clotted before they even reached the lab. And I think that, that was a real barrier to entry for us for Ireland because on post was sigh. <laughs> and then private couriers said, well, we don't want to deal with biological substances. And we've only just come over that hurdle. And that's a real regret for me because Ireland is such a it's such a perfect market because there is no other accessible care. People respect healthcare. They respect the level of, of detail that you've gone into, whereas in the UK they take it for granted. And so my regret is not being able to get into Ireland sooner and not maybe not because it was so hard we it down prioritized because it was just too difficult everything that we did there was another blocker so free and open then guys do you want to take a go at that question or we skip it my regret would be more around is it me? I agree, yeah, people. <laughs> <laughs> All three. Um, I think my regret would be more around like the journey. So we started our business three years ago and we started it out of um, my very small garage down in West Fork and um, like a big 18 meter truck arrived outside my house with hundreds of thousands of tampons and I was like, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> So like, so, um, that's me. <laughs> you have no idea. They were like, have you seen what she's doing? Yeah. <laughs> um, and anyway, but um, the thing about it is, I wish I took more photos. I wish I enjoyed it more. You know, we did that for a year and a half nearly, and we were in my garage, ordering pizza, drinking beers, packing boxes. You know, and because we couldn't afford a distribution center, we couldn't afford to pay for anyone else to do it for us. And. I really miss those that that part of the journey of being so involved, and um, because as you get bigger, your problems get bigger. You talk about funding, you talk about hiring, 
and um, it all becomes way heavier. So I just wish that I enjoyed those smaller milestones that are so enjoyable and took more photos. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's a really good one. <laughs> yeah, it seems a bit minuscule compared to yours. I'm a simple, simple person. <laughs> Um, changing tack slightly, this is a more serious question again, um, but again, happy to get your views on it. So we face an uncertain 2024 after a challenging 23. So what practical steps do you typically take to help you navigate these uncertain market conditions? So I guess what's driving that question is, as CEOs of startups, we know our cost base. That's the one certain we know our, you know, how much we're paying salaries. The, the big unknown is, is, of course, on the revenue side, and sort of when you've got uncertain conditions, it's more difficult to forecast and predict with accuracy. So, I got any any practical tips as to how you individually approach your businesses in terms of? I, I think it's like I just I, the last eighteen months, everyone kept telling us when we were doing our fundraising, it was going to be a terrible, terrible period. But like, there's a few things that are true. Uh, like, if you're doing something disruptive, that usually means you're doing it faster, better, or cheaper. And um, my budgets are getting cut. People want new solutions, they're looking at new things. When teams get cut, when more work gets put on their plate and they're not able to hire that new person, then you, you, it's a huge opportunity. For us, um, I don't know if I know a few other people, anyone in the general AI space, we're probably the third of three of the biggest technological revolutions over the last 18 months. Um, huge opportunity there. When, cut, like when budgets are cut, there's opportunity. And I think good businesses are still getting funded. Good businesses are still getting chosen against uh, incumbent suppliers, and for us, one of the big things is employers. Employees are way, way happier. Like why it's such we had such like tricky conversations around retention because everyone, like, and this kind of may come across weird, but like everyone was looking at their friends who were pay, being paid way more and who were being allowed all these things. And when the market restricts, I think there is a better like, wow, what we have is actually really, really good here. And when you're hiring, the talent is off the charts. Like we were trying to compete with Meta, and you just you can't when it comes to hiring and pay packages. But when COVID hit, then people started to think about what's important, and they started to make different decisions. And I thought with winning business, I think it's been easier because you're driving costs down. I think if you're opt opportunistic around the technology with Gen AI, which we, we have been, you again put yourself in a really good position where the incumbents can't move fast enough. And in keeping and bringing in people, we found it beneficial. So I remember putting it in an investor deck as an opportunity, not really believing myself. But then 18 months down the line, we've actually ended up in a much better position. That's our personal experience. Again, B2B SaaS, it's not the sexiest thing in the world, but like it is, it just, it, I don't have the same challenges as much more difficult industries. But in those market conditions, we've actually found it that, again, maybe it's glass half full, but it's been an opportunity more than anything. I think it's a, it's a great positive outlook, and it's actually probably right because you know you look at some of in, in our space, and, and pretty much every market is saturated, right? But one of our competitors has got eight um, people on the books, and I can see that they're hiring, and they're hiring 150k, 120k, um, and demand is sort of plateaued a little bit. So I, I I know it might be hot in my seat, but I wouldn't like to be running a business on meeting 800 payroll every month um, of six figures. Um, onion. So when we started our, <laughs> um, Deirdre and I were both uh, EOI finalists last year for the Entrepreneur of the Year, so um, we always have each other's backs, I feel. <laughs> um, but yeah, we when we started our business, we tried everything, which is a typical startup thing to do as well. So we tried retail, um, D2C and B2B. When we first launched, we very much saw ourselves as a D2C business. And then six months in, we got a phone call from Vodafone, and they said, "Hey, can you put this in our in our corporate bathrooms?" And like any good startup, we said, "Yes, absolutely." We hung up the phone, and then we panicked, and then we figured. <laughs> and I think we spent the last. We're very performance and data driven as well. So we spent the last nearly three years looking at you know where was our revenues coming from, and what was our opportunity as well. And you know, we're a small team, so resource is really important, you know, where you're where you're focusing your time. So we started off DTC retail and B2B, and we have very much paired back on retail. We're only thread a couple of we're in Mars pharmacies in Ireland and we're not putting any more money or resource into that channel. Um, and then with our D2C, we're very much pulling back on marketing costs at the moment. Digital marketing is crazy at the moment. Um, so we're very much pulling back our costs there and we're focusing on our B2B strategy. 
And I think that looking at that um, of, of the data in the last three years and understanding where our revenues did come from has made us come into 2024 really strong and has made the team really focused in what we're trying to achieve as well. Because I think they were feeling really overwhelmed. You know, us three as co-founders can feel overwhelmed, that's fine, it's part of the job. But we don't want our team feeling just as overwhelmed. So focus was a big thing for us this year and that's why I'm in London and really building out and um, the corporate side of our business here as well. Shameless plug if anyone works for any big corporate offices and wants to talk to me after, I'll be here. Um, but yeah, so I think focus is a big thing for us and um, so far so good, it's working well. Excellent. Did you want to take that question? I can't even remember what the question was. I, <laughs> I guess it was just the outlook for 24 and you could be doom and gloom merchant or you could be like Charlie, very upbeat and positive and sort of... Yeah, no, I'm tired of the doom and gloom, I'm tired of the black swan, so I think yeah. this is, this is going to be the year to um, to thrive. Last year was survive, this year is thrive, and I think um, I think for, for, for what you said in terms of you know workplace benefits, for what we're doing, we've seen it's, it's very slow to begin with because you have to, you're not just selling a product, you're selling a societal change. You're, so you're, you're this complete and utter shift in how we view reproductive health care, for example, or tampons, it's no longer something where people go, Jesus, Jesus, you say tampons? In a room full of predominantly men. That's like, great. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to mention being doing software, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sass is sexy, do the best you can find it. Um, and I think that that's a, the, the way I view, say, reproductive health benefits to 2024 is how people view mental health benefits to 2010. In 2010, people were like, mental health, is that just for that guy? Is it just, is that like depression? That's something that one in maybe 100 people really suffer with. And now mental health is like every single person's mental health matters. And I think that's the shift that I'm seeing for this year is that reproductive health impacts absolutely everyone. Whether, and if you're a man, it's the fact that it's your daughter, it's your wife. Hormones dictate your life, your, your skin, your mood, your weight, your metabolism, your sex drive. Our hormones are the key thing, whether it's men or women, that are determining those things in our life. And how we're impacted by those in the workplace, I think, is a very big thing that we're, we're going to come to the reckoning of in terms of your performance, your ability. And it's not just about fertility benefits, or it's not just about menopause policies. It's about being able to cater for employees' well-being throughout their reproductive lifespan. So if someone's actively trying to conceive or someone's experiencing symptoms and the impact that that has on their workplace or someone's going through fertility issues or pregnant, postpartum, perimenopause, menopause, that spans someone's entire lifespan and whether it's the woman that it's impacting or their partner, their child, we did, a, we did an event at, we do educational seminars, we did an event at Goldman Sachs and someone very senior stood up at the end and he said, I have a menopausal wife and two hormonal daughters, and I'm way too old to be learning all this for the first time. <laughs> and so that's where I see that there's, that there's a welcome change to the narrative in how, in how we view and prioritise reproductive health and hormonal health generally. Excellent. Well, Jack, how are we looking on time? Another quote, we've got another 20 minutes, right? Have we? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, guess who's Percy tonight? <laughs> <laughs> the Guinness is already set then, so um, I do want to open it to the floor though. Can we open it to the floor? Do you want a last question? We skip the last question, then we're going to open it to the floor. Is everyone okay with that? Um, ooh, this is the one you wrote. This is the one How can the Irish diaspora better support future Irish founders? Is that the one? Unedited? Sure. Charlie, can I start with you? How can the Irish diaspora better support future Irish founders? I think just connecting them, like consolidation and connection is probably the key. Um, like I, for whatever reason, I will reach out to absolutely anyone. Apologies if anyone's got a LinkedIn message for me. Uh, but it means that myself and I only meet up and we chat about God, that hiring thing was really, really difficult. How have you got about that? Are you looking for office space in London? Where's good? Every single problem that I'm going to face, someone else has solved. Um, and I think the way that the Irish diaspora can help there is by having consolidation and connection. Like I had to hunt out six different networks, try and figure out how do I find a way to the right people with the right problems and how can I give first? You know, how can I help the next university student who wants to move to London and set up their own thing? And I think that is probably the biggest thing because again, 
anyone on YouTube, anyone has probably solved the problem you're about to face, and I think connecting them uh, is one thing, and then sharing in the problems that you're probably having, and then enjoying it along the way. It's probably the main thing. Hundred percent agree. Yes, a great, great one for pointing. You mean the mic you get through? Yeah. Um, I think events like this, to be honest, are, are great. I think um, the Irish Network are phenomenal and the entrepreneurial space, the Irish entrepreneurs are incredible. The fact that they will take a call or any bit of time, you do just really need to reach out. Um, so yeah, I think events like this and really just getting out of your comfort zone and trying to actually face-to-face -face meet as many people as possible, I think is really helpful. I will just say that I've now, because I've been in London for 16 years, I feel like I've withered in terms of my, don't say, wait, no, not in terms of my husband. <laughs> um, I have. I've withered in terms of my expectations of people, like Irish people innately want to help. And I feel like whether you overhear someone who's struggling or you see someone, there's that voluntary thing to say, how can I help? How can I be helpful? And it just isn't the same in London, it just isn't the same for generally English people, I know I married one, but it's, I think that the recognition that people, uh, maybe I need to open myself up to the recognition that Irish people will be more helpful and so that I need to open myself to, to reach out to, to more people to help instead of just trudging and, and trying to carry it all. I think this, the, the flip side of it is knowing that it's there as opposed to wishing that there was something there. Yeah, a typical small plug for Digital Irish, I mean, it's fine on LinkedIn and you find profiles of myself, Jack, others on the committee and just, just reach out, so very happy to help if we can. Um, okay, I'm going to open to the floor. Jack will let me know how many questions we can go through before the Guinness is... Two or three. <laughs> two or three, so can we do long questions or short questions? Short questions. Uh, <laughs> short questions. Anybody got any questions? If you do, put up your hand and just uh, let me know. Uh, if, you, if you would mind saying your name as well. Uh, hi, I'm Jerry Westrop. I'm a Goldman Sachs, or whatever, I've met you before. Um, I'm interested, it sounds like the Irish early founders scene is fantastic. We hear great things about Europe. Why are you in London at all? I came here to do a master's in medical law, so I did a master's in King's College London with the intention of then going back to Ireland. Um, and then I, I guess I stayed because I, I worked at a, a US international law firm that was in London and that opportunity of working for such a large and global international firm was a big appeal to me. So it was a check size. Ours is to become a global company. Like it, for whatever reason Dublin's great and there's amazing companies that have done it from Ireland but um, I remember uh, someone scoffing in a meeting that Ireland was like Manchester. And do you know what I mean in terms of size scale? They're right, you know. And by us being in London, by us being in New York, it showcases not only we're going to deliver, but we can do it globally. And perception matters, storytelling matters, and people want to be part of whatever that is, that graph, whatever way it looks. And I think for me, um, it was talent and it was global perception. Like that was really the key. And um, it was to be taken seriously when you're speaking to the biggest brands in the world. Like Dublin's great when it comes to big tech companies, but we were selling to CPG. And um, you know, beyond Kerry Foods and, and the odd, there's, you know, there, there really isn't that connection to it. So for us, it was it was really important that we were taken seriously and that we had the best people in the best places in the world. And London and New York still carry that weight. Yeah, for us, it was really the market size here. So we have been um, successful to say the, to say the least in Ireland. Uh, we have over 160 corporate clients there. So for us, it makes sense. Um, because people are actually more advanced here um, in having period products in their workspace, so it's very much about educating them on the benefits of our 100% organic cotton versus mainstream period products that are often made with rayon um, in, in the bathroom. So for us, it's very much just expanding out. It's another English speaking as well, um, which makes sense for us, and we do think it's a, a hop until um, the US as well. Um, and true fun here, everybody. <laughs> Question. Anybody else? Yeah, I've got a question. I'll just drop the mic over to you. Thanks, John. <coughs> Hi, um, so I've always been quite fascinated with uh, the grit and resolve that entrepreneurs have in terms of kind of sticking with it. And I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, and I often say, sort of that's uh, champagne or rose of razor blades in terms of the highs or the lows. So how do you kind of dealt with, you know, 
what must be incredibly challenging, stressful times, but kind of sticking with it, staying focused, and uh, yeah, yeah, hanging in there. And I think it's, at times being an entrepreneur is quite a solitary position to do that. I, yeah, I always find it quite fascinating how entrepreneurs kind of just keep going, but potentially everything is against them. So just hearing your personal experiences would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, one of the things for me is that I think if you're okay with the most likely thing is that you're going to fail, like the most likely thing. If you're doing, setting up a company for a financial incentive, you won't last. Um, and I think if you stare the truth enough in the face, you become really numb to it in a way that's really helpful and liberating, um, that it's most likely not going to work. Now, this is actually, even, it's an optimistic take, actually, um, because you're doing it for the right reasons. You're doing it because you like solving hard problems with people you love and trust. And the, the feeling of doing something you've no right to do is more energizing than any other job could give me. Um, and now I think the problem with the more practical advice is you need to sculpt your whole life around longevity. Like you need to be willing to give 10 plus years to it. And I think the thing that I didn't get right at the start was burning the candle at both ends. I was trying to be a 22 year old and run a business and you just you just completely destroy yourself. Um, and I think now I'm trying to figure out what company is 70 year old Charlie gonna set up? In what industry, in what problem? And that means that like truly, truly embodying balance, like not working weekends, making sure you build a company that you would want to work for. Um, so you can still enjoy the kind of the challenge of it, but you're being practical about it. And any investor who tried to write me a check and expected me to be on with them at midnight, I wouldn't take his money. For her money. No way. I hundred percent agree with that. And I think for me personally, um, my dad had his own business for 36 years. It's all I'd ever seen. So I kind of, it's like monkey see, monkey do, really. And not that he was coming up every night and um, explaining all the highs and the lows, but I saw the freedom of his life that it gave him. And I also saw the enjoyment he got out of it. Um, and I think that's why I keep going. And I think it's just in me then as well. So I'd say that's a part of it. Um, but as I said earlier, I think a founding team, and if that's, even if it's not a founding team, if it's a really strong leadership team, I think is really important, um, because it can be really lonely. So having people around you that you can trust and go on the journey with together, and not take it all too seriously. It's all going to be fine. <laughs> Mine is that we are, we are such a mission-led company. We are, our, our aim is to reduce infertility from one in five to one in 50, and we can now diagnose over 18 gynecological conditions within eight days. And the average diagnosis time for some of these conditions is eight years. So the reduction in diagnosis time is bringing people the adequate care means that we have such an additional layer of responsibility towards people. And I think that that's one of the biggest driving forces because it, it's tough and it's been really tough to, to get the level of regulations to continue to persevere. Um, having that, we, we got a message from someone said fertility is the reason I'm holding my 10 month old daughter and things like that make you go okay just keep going the bags are fine just you know and it's, it's one of the things that we're, whether it's someone who we diagnosed that they had um, a condition that prevented the cancer from getting worse or diagnosed something that was completely would have been benign and then grew to the 13 centimeter cyst she would never have checked it unless we existed and I think that 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 level of care, meaning that people are provided with an access to care that they would never have otherwise been provided with. You know, there's people even in our team, everyone in our team does testing, a um, compliment because we provide them with testing and scanning for free, um, even though it's a great cost to us. But even in our own team, we've had a 25 year old who has an egg reserve of a 45 year old, and she would never ever have figured that out had she not had the benefit of being able to check in on the reproductive health. She'd have, Still, the typical wait a decade, then try and realize that it was all too late. And I think that that's, that's for me is the thing that keeps me going is knowing that we're genuinely helping people to have live better lives and also create lives. Here, here. That's okay, we're, we're going to wrap up there. Fascinating insights from the panelists. So, I'd love if you could all put your hands together and thank the panel. quite a lot there and I think a lot of inspiration for what we heard as well so we, we thank you very much for your time and for all, all that you do and um, 
there's just a few more things to do. Mainly just wander around the room and, and have some free and <laughs> drink. There, there, there's, um, there's a few people, a, I, actually there's a lot of people in the room want to help. In fact, I think everyone in this room wants to help everybody else. Well, some of you may be competitors, in which case you should lie to each other about the kids. I'm not an entrepreneur, but that's probably good advice. I see Jeremy McCarthy from Enterprise Ireland and her colleagues are here in the room, then to head into Norway for the UK region for Enterprise Ireland. Patrick Rothschild was mentioned, and, and, and Aileen and Karen from the Enterprise team, the MC, Jack and all the team, Digital Ireland. And there's even some help in English people, which isn't what he asks. It's been an extraordinary occasion. <laughs> Please let the uh, conclude is with uh, some Irish products which are available in the corner. We clear away the chairs and uh, we, we can keep the conversation going. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Just say thank you again to the embassy for having us. It's a real honour to be able to host an event here. Uh, I just want to short speech. Um, so, Digital Irish is a non-profit. We rely on the support of the Irish government, the Department of Foreign Affairs, sponsors like Jane Weston for uh, paying the food and drink as well as the venues. If people want to pay for it Digital Irish, digitalirish.com, reach out to us. Um, but also, uh, as I said, Climate Tech is our next event that we'll be hosting in, in, in April. Hopefully we'll see a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of you there. And I think the, you know, the overriding message and that question that Alan mentioned I seeded into the conversation was on, you know, how could we help you? And remember, these are the people on the stage who have succeeded. I'm a proud, twice-failed founder myself. Uh, so I'm just sitting here laughing at myself. But uh, there are a lot of people in the room who aren't looking to be a founder, just looking to get a decent job in London. Um, and it's, from what I learned on the panel here, the trade-offs of moving to a global city like London and the opportunity that brings uh, also has trade-offs and it seems that we lose some of our identity and how we operate as a community. So kind of this is just a, um, an imploring people in the room to bring a little bit of that back and pay it forward and encourage others to do so. Um, we're here now until, the reason I was trying to wrap up the panel a little bit quicker is because we, we have, we're here until 8.30 uh, and then there's a uh, horse and groom pub around the corner for anyone who uh, partakes. But um, thanks again for everyone here and uh, in particular for our fantastic panel.